223 seats to 212, 211 here. Uh, and that's what we saw here before the election. And of course, all 435 seats were up uh, for contention today. Now, at, these, at this particular point, the way we're calling it, Democrats with 198 seats, Republicans with 226, and 10 at this hour still undecided. Now, getting to some of the individual races, here's one that uh, we have been watching very closely, and this is a, uh, quite a pickup for the Democrats here. This is in the House District 8 in Maryland. Connie Morella, who was the Republican uh, 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 incumbent there, and some, seen as a centrist Republican, did not hold her seat. Chris Van Hollen did beat her in this race, as you see there, 52% to 47. In Iowa, second district there, Jim Leach holds on to his seat uh, against uh, Thomas there. Leach usually seemingly to invite strong challenges, and this time around he was able to beat this one back rather convincingly. And in Iowa in the House District 1, Nussel there defe defeating Hutchinson there with again another convincing margin, 57 to 43. As you said, quite a few House races out there, so let's go ahead and check out a few more. This one in Connecticut, the incumbent, uh, Johnson. When this was an incumbent incumbent, this was through redistricting. Um, as we move on, so uh, Johnson picking up that seat. And here's another incumbent incumbent race. This one, uh, House District 17 out of Pennsylvania. Holden beating Geekus. And in Illinois, a pickup for the Republicans, Shimkus beating Phelps, another one. Three races there where because of redistricting, you had incumbents facing incumbents in new districts. Yeah, that was a pretty ugly campaign as well. I mean, one candidate was accusing the other one of stalking it in this case. And now I'm going to a great state of Ohio, the House District 17 here. This was one that we were all watching uh, quite closely. Uh, the district there uh, in the Youngstown area where Jim Traffigan had been re representing that, uh, that district now. And it's gonna be uh, Tim Ryan going as, in this case now as a Democrat. Um, Jim Trafficking's campaign that he waged from his uh, jail cell in downtown Pennsylvania uh, apparently is going to fall a bit short. There. He has other plans now. <laughs> he's he's going to be busy for a while. Uh, moving on to California, District 18, Dennis Cardoza versus Dick Monteith. As you see there, right now we've got with 79% of the precincts reporting, we can't call this one yet, and we're not going to, but we're right now seeing uh, that uh, Cardoza is ahead and uh, being reminded that this, this was Gary Condit's uh, district that he's now not going to be running at. Now, going to the House District 5 in Florida, there we had a, a three-way uh, run out there with uh, uh, Brown Waite uh, now the, uh, holding on right now. It looks like a pickup there for the Republicans over Thurman and Gargan. All right, and a couple more House races here as we wait to hear from Jim Talent, who will be the senator-elect from Missouri. Um, in Florida, a pickup for the Republicans as Shaw beats Roberts. Another one. Now, here's a face that, that's a recognizable face from 2000. Mm -hmm. uh, Kathleen Harris um, becoming Congresswoman. Congresswoman Harris, as uh, she makes a run for Congress and uh, leaves Florida, at least the state office, behind. And that's a pickup for the Republicans as well. And in South Dakota, this was a very interesting race because you had a governor running against an upstart up-and-comer. I think uh, Bill Schneider, didn't you pick this as one of your faces to watch? I certainly uh, did. Stephanie Herseth. Well, we'll be watching, but we won't be watching her. <laughs> you won't be watching her in Congress. To Congress, not yet, <laughs> but um, it's probably not the last we have heard from her. No. All right, going down to the Arizona House District 1 here. We've got uh, Rick Renzi, a Mexican-born businessman. Uh, he's basically here as uh, beaten uh, Cordova. Uh, and uh, what was... Actually, we are not saying that he's beaten, but it's 70 percent. That's what this we're saying right now. This is that brand new district lead. that they. Uh... But right now, we do want to go to someone that we believe that is going to declare himself a winner. Jim Talent here now, the uh, who we believe may be uh, declared the winner of the race there for the Senate seat in Missouri. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> we were. Thank you. Thank you all. I would have started a minute ago, but we were waiting on Brenda. That happens sometimes in our house. <laughs> Believe it or not, I'm almost speechless. <laughs> I want to say. Thank you. 
Well, uh, I have um, tossed out the canned speeches after tonight. I want to just say really three things. The first is I appreciated very much the phone call that I got from Mrs. Carnahan and her comments uh, on television. She, um, I've, um, I've known Jean and I knew Mel for a long time and she conducted herself with the dignity and the grace with which she has conducted herself in office and in this campaign and I'm grateful to her uh, for the way she has conducted herself and for her call. I, 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 I know what it is like to make a call like that when you have lost a close race. It isn't easy. It takes a lot of courage. Second thing I want to do is to thank all of you again from the bottom of my heart. I, you have We have behind us the dedicated team which has led this campaign for the last uh, 14, 15 months, uh, which has shepherded me all over the state of Missouri. <laughs> I've often felt like the hood ornament of a nice car. <laughs> and they just sort of steered me around all over the place and, uh, and, and pulled off uh, a great victory. And I'm grateful to them, more grateful than I can ever say to them. I'm grateful to Kit Bond for his hard efforts and his advice. I'm, um, thank you, Kit. I'm grateful to our state party chairman, Ann Wagner, for her great work. And to, um, and to John Hancock, who, unusually for him, is trying to stay out of the line. John, come on up. John. Well, as you can see, uh, spirits are quite high there at the uh, talent uh, campaign headquarters there in Missouri. Uh, it's been a long night for them. They've been waiting uh, for a long time to get this result because the, raise, the, the margin was a razor-thin one in this race with Jean Carnahan. Our Carol Lynn has been there. She's been all night uh, covering this race. Let's go check in with her right now. Carol. Leon, uh, they're airing CNN right now, so I'm going to have to block out the echo that is probably going to be airing behind me. But I just want to give you some highlights from Jean Carnahan's speech. Uh, she came out to greet some of her supporters, uh, many of whom had tears in their eyes. We knew that uh, an announcement was going to be in imminent because of just the expressions on people's faces here. I'm going to try to block out the echo by plugging my ear. Uh, at any rate, uh, what she was saying is uh, she wanted to thank her staff and she wanted to say that they were working uh, courageously against uh, tremendous odds. She quoted uh, her, her late husband, a favorite saying of his, don't let the fire go out, and she promises that the fire will not, obviously implying that the Democratic Party here is still going to be working towards many of their goals uh, in Washington in one form or another. Uh, in the meantime, Jim Talent, uh, by all consensus here, uh, not at the Democratic headquarters, but several political analysts I've spoken to over the last several days. He ran an excellent campaign. He is known to be uh, very cerebral, very policy driven, and generally a pretty nice guy. I mean, he made the point of writing thank you notes after all of his events. He went heavily after the African American vote. A uh, strategy very interesting in recruiting a very popular Democratic congressman, Clay Lacey, here to introduce him at a rally. Uh, he also invited the housing and urban. Um, area secretary uh, to come and have a, a housing development uh, seminar here. He started a group called Talent for Women, profiling uh, key Republican women like uh, former presidential advisor Karen Hughes uh, to show that uh, the Republican Party was going to be friendly towards women. And women and African Americans may very well have made the difference in this race for Republicans, each uh, casting up to 40 percent of the total ballots in the state of Missouri, usually making the big difference in these very tight 
flight races. Um, and you can't ignore the fact uh, that President Bush was just here uh, less than 24 hours ago. Uh, the coattail effect very strong here as uh, the candidates were playing off flag waving issues, homeland security versus pocketbook issues. Gene Carnahan talking a lot about uh, getting Medicare to pay for prescription drugs, extending unemployment benefits, really playing to a very tough economy here in the state of Missouri. Jim Talent speaking about those issues as well, but really emphasizing homeland security, really emphasizing that he was going to be backing the president at a time that the uh, country uh, may be getting ready to go to war against Iraq. And clearly, uh, Leon, it's a strategy that worked, but this was a razor thin margin here. I mean, Gene Carnahan lost by about 30,000 votes. And you heard Jim Talent uh, talking about how he related to that feeling. He lost the governor's race just two years ago by only 20,000 votes. Uh, so um, he is grateful for the win. Jean Carnahan, very gracious in her concession speech. Leon. All right. Thank you very much, Carol. So we've got a, both the, a word from both sides of that, that race in Missouri there from uh, the Jim Talent camp. Uh, they're claiming victory this evening. And Jean Carnahan, who has now conceded defeat. Thanks, Carol. Carol Lynn reporting live for us now. Darren. Now I want to focus on some governor races, including one that we're ready to, to project, and that is the state of Alaska. CNN ready to project that Frank Murkowski, the senator from Alaska, will be the next governor of that state as he beats the lieutenant governor the current lieutenant governor, and that is Fran Ulmer, one of the uh, 10 women that was nominated for governor in this year's race. Let's go ahead and check out some other governor races, gubernatorial races that we've been tracking throughout the night. There you see the uh, Alaska card. Frank Murkowski goes from the Senate. He goes home from a legislative position to an executive position as he will run Alaska. Now to Florida. This was an early call. The brother of the president, Jeb Bush, going for a second term in Florida as he beats Bill McBride. In the state of New York, this one, um, as expected, George Pataki will hold on to his seat as governor of New York as he beats Carl McCall. And here are the others um, that were running in New York as independents. And here in California, we called this one um, just a little bit ago, the uh, incumbent Gray Davis. Despite a lack of incredible popularity in the state of California, he will hold on to his race as he beats the Republican challenger, Bill Simon. All right, we want to talk about uh, the, uh, some of these uh, governor's races here. We see the Texas governor race. They're calling this one for uh, Rick Perry. There were 77 percent of the precincts reporting, uh, defeating a Democratic uh, uh, nominee uh, Sanchez there. Now, here is the Oklahoma's governor's race. And uh, again, now with all the precincts reporting here, uh, no call being made quite yet. As you can see, it looks like a, a very like a dead tie, a dead heat here between uh, Henry and, and Steve Largent, uh, which is something of a surprise considering that Largent was a heavy favorite. Talk about name recognition. I don't think anyone in Oklahoma, besides maybe the governor now, <laughs> has more name recognition than Steve Largent, but we'll watch that race. And here in Georgia, perhaps one of the biggest surprises of the evening, Sonny Perdue who was not even on the radar screen with uh, Governor Roy Barnes, the incumbent, a couple of weeks ago. And suddenly, within the last couple of days here, we saw this race tighten up, and a lot of people couldn't understand how it was happening. Governor Roy Barnes had an incredible, huge advantage with the war chest. Money didn't matter in this particular case. It did not hold the margin for him. And as we saw, they are projecting here now that uh, Sonny Perdue is going to be the governor-elect of Georgia. Now, let's talk some more about these governor's races, particularly this, this big surprise in Georgia with a couple of people who are with us this evening who have been watching this quite closely themselves. Uh, Ralph Reed. Uh, analyst and uh, uh, political uh, activist himself and who has been quite active in trying to get more and more Republicans elected across the country. You see him there on the left and also joining us is Cynthia Tucker with the Atlanta Journal-Constitution who of course has been watching this race very closely and I must say first of all congratulations to you and your team Ralph Reed. You've got to be very happy about the results you've seen so far this evening. Well we really are. We're, we're thrilled by Sonny Perdue's victory. Uh, uh, thrilled that uh, Saxby Chambliss uh, was able to win a U.S. Senate seat that was critical. Uh, we picked up two and potentially three congressional seats, one's too close to call, defeated the Democrat Speaker of the House, defeated the Democrat uh, State Senate Majority Leader, and of course we've had a great night across the board nationally and we've won the U.S. Senate back. So the person who I think deserves the most credit for tonight's victory is the President of the United States. Yeah, and we've heard that quite often throughout the evening. He gave us a new brand of leadership to be associated with that was conservative, but also compassionate, that was principled, but also inclusive.
that made clear that we would leave no child behind, that made it clear that our party was a new and different party. And the reason why we really won tonight, to be honest with you, is because our candidates associated themselves with that style of leadership. Cynthia, well, how about that? Well, let me ask you about what happened here, but particularly with these two races that Ralph just mentioned here, with the Saxby Chambliss uh, there, as we, as we saw there, uh, the, the defeating Max Cleland for the Senate seat here in Georgia. Another big surprise here today, a as well as uh, Sonny Perdue beating uh, Roy Barnes here for the governor's seat here. What does this say about either these candidates or about the Democratic Party this evening? Well, if you look across the state, quite frankly, uh, Leon, as Ralph just said, the Republicans have had a very big night in Georgia. They've had a big night across the nation. They've had an especially big night here in Georgia. And I think if you went state to state, Georgia is the state where the biggest upsets took place. The Saxby Chambliss win, quite frankly, isn't that big a surprise. Why Max not? Cleland, Max Cleland won six years ago by a very narrow margin, about 28,000 votes. Uh, the Republican um, National Committee honed in on that race very early thinking Max was weak. They poured a lot of money into Chambliss's race, and obviously President Bush paid a lot of attention to it. The much, much bigger surprise is Sonny Perdue's win over Roy Barnes. No one saw that coming, with the possible exception of Ralph Reed, who's sitting next to me tonight. I don't think even Sonny Perdue expected that. And I think while the president deserves some of the credit, his personal popularity is enormous in Georgia, and he started to pay some attention to Sonny Purdue's race later on. I think there were also some particular issues here in the state, and maybe Georgia voters were just tired of the predominant good old boy leadership coming from the Democratic Party. Well, let's talk about the Democratic Party from uh, your perspective, Ralph Reed. What does this say to you about the Democratic Party? Well, I think uh, they, they were hurt by a number of things. Uh, they were hurt by the fact, in the case of Max Cleland, he had voted 11 times against the president on Homeland Security, had voted 22 times to delay or gut his tax cut, uh, had cast a lot of votes that were out of touch with Georgia values and that were in opposition to the president. And I wouldn't disagree with Cynthia. It's not as big a surprise as the governor's race. Mm -hmm. What could be? We haven't elected a governor in Georgia who's a Republican in 135 years. But I would just make this point. Saxby Chambliss, 90 days ago, trailed Max Cleland by 15 to 20 points. And Max Cleland had never lost a political campaign in his career. Mm -hmm. So it was a big victory. I think in the governor's race and the other state legislative races, uh, we didn't just say what we were against. We said what we were for. We unveiled the declaration of a new Georgia. It was an eight-point legislative program that included lower taxes, education reform, fiscal discipline, ethics reform. We have very lax ethics laws here in Georgia. And, uh, you know, we've been real good about saying what we didn't like. We haven't been as good at offering a positive vision. Sonny Perdue and our other candidates did that. Final thing is this. George W. Bush came here on Saturday. He came not to one city but two. Uh, he spent six hours in Georgia. We believe that provided the last three to five points to get these and other candidates across the finish line. Uh, you know, and that would seem to, to pretty much confirm that there is something of a coattail effect here with George W. Bush and the different states that he has been campaigning in, in the last few days. And Cynthia, I'm wondering if I detected a bit of hesitancy on your, on your part to concede that. No, no, no. I think that um, you have to give the president a lot of credit for the way Republicans have done across the nation. I think he has turned back the conventional wisdom that perhaps presidential coattails aren't that long. He has tremendous popularity here in Georgia and a surprising amount of popularity apparently across the nation, but also think that there are some particular things in Georgia. And while Republicans in Georgia mostly ran positive campaigns, I think it has to be said that in the governor's race, there was a divisive issue around the state flag in which Roy Barnes was very courageous in going ahead and pushing the state legislature to change the flag. Sonny Perdue, on the other hand, has kept saying that he would bring the issue back up again and throw it back into a state referendum. That will be very divisive for the state of Georgia, and Sonny Perdue will now have to figure out how to usher the state through that. Well, let me ask you both quickly if you can weigh in on this last question I have because we've got to go. But I wonder if, if what you can look at here when you combine this, this national, this nationwide coattail that we may, coattail effect we may have seen this evening, is there any way that this is going to be translated into a mandate for President Bush, Ralph Reed. 
I don't think there's any question about it. I mean, the, the, the President of the United States put his political capital on the line, in effect nationalized these uh, elections around the issues of his homeland security and economic agenda, and the American people clearly rallied uh, to his side. What we're watching tonight uh, has not happened in the Republican Party since the Civil War and has not happened for a president since 1934 when Franklin Delano Roosevelt did it, and that is to, uh, in effect, win two elections in a row uh, and to win them big. And so I think the president is going to see pretty quick action on some of these judicial nominations that have been held up. I think he will get a Homeland Security Department. I think the Congress will make his tax cut permanent. Um, and, and I will just say this, I've been involved in this party for over a quarter of a century, and uh, I've never seen a leader of our party or our country who provided a style of leadership and integrity and a clarity of vision that rallied not only our own troops in an off-year election, but a lot of independent voters as well. All right, Cynthia, quickly if you can. Oh, I, I would have to agree with Ralph on that. The president now has the mandate he did not have in 2000 when he was elected. He's clearly much more popular now than he was when he was elected. Much of that has to do with the aftermath of 9-11 and uh, the popularity of the way he's handled that issue. He's now going to be able to push through a very conservative agenda, and it remains to be seen whether that agenda is as popular as he is. Cynthia and Tucker, Ralph Reed, thank you very much. Appreciate you folks sticking around and giving us some time this evening. And uh, I think we've only heard the beginning, the very beginning of all these historical references as to what happened tonight and the historical perspective of it all. So stay with us. We'll have much more uh, of the results uh, still to come in for you this evening, as well as more analysis just ahead after break. So don't go away.